I'm Lee Pacquia, and this is Behind the Headlines. We're taking another look at the world of high-frequency trading today. After high-profile market glitches such as the flash crash of 2010, the Facebook IPO, the BATS IPO, Knight Capital, and more, some members of Congress and the SEC have called for a deeper examination of the risks associated with high-speed trading. But the question is, will these investigations lead to any meaningful reforms? We're asking Ralph Ferrara. He's a partner at Proskauer. And in a former life, of course, Ralph was general counsel to the SEC from 1978 to 1981. He joins us from Washington, D.C. We're happy to have him here. Ralph, thanks for joining us. Welcome. Of, cor of course, Lee. Um, I want to start off by talking about how we got to this point. Uh, I've always assumed that high frequency trading came to account for roughly half of the stock market activity because of technical progress. Computers uh, have come quite a long way, and that's allowed for, for the rise that we've seen in HFT. But you say it's a little bit more complicated. Why is that? Well, it, it, actually, it's, it's considerably more complicated than that. I mean, clearly, you've got these mind boggling analytics that are a product of 2012 and kind of recent years to 2012, but really where we are today is as much a function of policy choices made over 40 years ago in the Securities Act Amendments of 1975 as they are with respect to the mind-boggling analytics mm. that we see today. Real quick, take us, real quick, take us through that. What, was, what were the policy yeah. changes that were made 40 years ago that <laughs> ended up giving rise to yeah. high-frequency trading yeah. 40 years later? That's, that's yeah. remarkable. 1975, the Congress of the United States, with the urging of the SEC, decided that we needed to have a national market system. The purpose of the national market system, among other things, was to achieve more competition in the markets, reduce spreads, make it cheaper for people to trade. Um, this came on the lip of a battle between the SEC and the New York Stock Exchange culminating in May of 1975 with the unfixing of minimum commission rates at the New York Stock Exchange. But what people failed to realize in 1975 is that we already had a national market system. It was called the New York Stock Exchange and it functioned beautifully. Why? Because it was an auction market where buyers and sellers could meet together in front of a specialist and that market operated with the th three key characteristics of a marketplace. Liquidity, that is an, act an active market where you could buy and sell. Depth, where you could actively buy and sell in size. And continuity, that is where you could actively buy and sell in size without materially affecting the market price on the purchase or sale side, the bid and the ask side. That's what we had, right? To the extent that there was an imbalance in the market, the specialist was there to assure, under his affirmative obligations, to make sure that we had all liquidity, depth, and continuity working. Now, you get the national market system, what happens? The Congress in 1975 with the SEC says, change the rules. Let's have competitive markets. And what results from that is a fragmentation of markets of the kind that we haven't seen since, where instead of one central market, under the, under the watchful eye of a specialist, you've got markets spreading out all over the country, indeed today all over the world, mm -hmm. under the watchful eye of no one. Mm -hmm. That's what the fundamental policy change was. And when you couple that with technological change, where buyers and sellers can meet with one another blindly, automatically, and in millionths of a second, You've eliminated the ability for anyone to assure that there's going to be continuity in pricing. So that what that means is that when you have a flash crash like in 2010 or the many flash crashes that we've had ever since or the night capital fiasco, when that happens, what it means is there is no mechanism, there is no specialist, there is no human hand, there isn't that millisecond that you need to correct the error. Mm. So now what people are talking about are things like, you know, um, oh, firewalls and kill switches and circuit breakers and that sort of thing, when indeed what they need is just that moment of pause, that instant of pause to make sure that someone is guiding that market. Right. We've lost that. Ralph, we're going to get to go solutions ahead. in a second, but just before we go any further, I was wondering, <laughs> uh, in your opinion, net-net, is high-frequency trading a benefit or a loss for other investors and the broader economy? I mean, here we are. You know, I mean, what was done a, in 1975 it, 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 was done. It, let me tell you, it all depends on what you call a benefit or a loss. If what you're saying is that you're ready to sacrifice other aspects of market integrity on the altar of competition and your sole goal, what's quote good, is decreasing spreads so that markets can operate and trades can be accomplished for minimum transaction costs, then technology is great. If on the other hand you're saying what you want to do is have a marketplace that will attract 
individual investors, retail investors, investors of every stripe to come into a market where they think they're going to get a fair shake and their order is going to mean something and not be trumped by someone who is worried about whether they're sitting right next door to the New York Stock Exchange or to a market center. Right. So that, you know, it, it depends. What do you think is good? What, what, is the, what is the benefit you're trying to achieve? Market integrity versus market efficiency. Is market efficiency defined as best price execution? execution with minimal transaction costs. If that's what you want, that's what you've got. But with that comes a sacrifice of market integrity. It's a big problem. We can't and I have think both? With the SC <laughs> well, you can have both to a limit. Some people are saying now, as to remedies, some people are saying that what you've got to do is you have to honor your price for 50 milliseconds. What that means is you're trying to introduce sanity into what is otherwise a completely interactive, electronic, algorithmic world. Mm -hmm. You're trying to introduce the pause. So how artificial is it to say that you're going to have a circuit breaker or a kill switch or a transaction tax to discourage people from trading, when indeed what you really need to do is to get, I think, in one way or another, the human element of judgment back into the process. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you kind of reverse the clock back uh, 40 years and go back to the specialist system, but it does mean that when you're trying to build an efficient algorithmic auction market where buyers and sellers can meet without the interposition of a third party or a dealer, it does mean that there has to be a system where judgment can still play a role. Mm. And that's what the SEC is missing, that's what Congress is missing, and frankly I hope at the end of the process of studying all of this, someone walks away and says, you know, the fragmentation that we drove these markets to starting in 1975 has to be reversed and there has to be a kind of centrality of the markets of the kind that we had prior to 1975, although you're never going to go back and reinvent the New York Stock mm. Exchange as it was then. So that's Does the that Ralph, make sense? That, that's the Ralph Ferrara fix, if, if I could paraphrase, uh, consolidate the markets to uh, <laughs> where they were kind of a little bit more centralized 40 years ago, and then install speed bumps. That's what on, we want? On, on quite Unquestionably what you want is a national market system that is a centralized market where all buyers and sellers can act with one another under the auspices of some mechanism that provides judgment to the process. What we've lost, what we pulled out of the process is human judgment making. That's got to be introduced back into it one way or the other, in my, in my sense. Mm. As a former regulator, I was always curious to, to know what goes <coughs> through your head when you see something like Knight Capital uh, unfold. I mean, that firm, it, it's a large firm, almost got wiped off the face of the earth in a matter of minutes. What did yeah. that look like to you? It, it's terrifying. I mean, uh, it, it's terrifying, particularly when you see that uh, an organization of that degree of sophistication couldn't catch a computer glitch, and a computer glitch in the course of 40 minutes could cost that firm $440 million. That's scary, and can I tell you, every person in this business, every person in this business took a deep breath after what happened to Knight Capital occurred, and they went back and said, my God, but for the grace of God, there goes I, and everybody's worried about it. Everybody's worried. And you know who's most worried about it? Is the retail investors who don't come into the market anymore. Yep. I mean, think about it. This algorithmic trading is taking, place, taking over, what, 50, 51 percent of our market today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's astounding. Yeah. Absolutely astounding. Someone was explaining. You got, guys like San you got guys like Sandy Lewis. You got guys like Sandy Lewis, who is also from this old school. Uh, Sandy Lewis saying, you know, the markets are all rigged and nobody should be buying and selling stocks anymore. Well, the markets aren't rigged. They're just broken, right? Yeah. They're just broken. Well, it's been, it's been uh, explained to me uh, off the record uh, by some sources as uh, a two-tier system where you essentially have sharks and manatees playing in the same pool, uh, manatees being the, the individual retail investor and sharks <laughs> being you know, algorithmic traders. Uh, does it make sense to put them in different pools at this point so no one gets hurt? No, because what you need to do, most important of all, is to have that central marketplace where all buy and sell orders meet on equal footing. That's what you need to have. Mm. And that's what we don't have today. Indeed, you have not only a two-tier system, you have a multi-tier system. It used to be, right, in the old days when you had the New York Stock Exchange and you had off-board trading rules, which meant that if you were a member of the exchange community, you couldn't trade a listed stock anywhere but on the floor of the exchange. Even there, even in those days, when there was a need, there were block positioners. You would go, if you had a huge block in his institution, you'd go to a financial institution and say, help me 
kind of unwind this block and not just bring the whole thing down to the floor. So there was some fragmentation even back then, but it was nothing like what we've got today. All orders were meant to go to the exchange floor. And to, today what we've got to have is the investing public believe that all their, that their orders, along with the orders of the high-speed traders, can come to one central marketplace and be given fair execution. Not just best execution, not just best price, which many people are calling best execution today, and best execution was always meant to be much more than best price but they want best execution along with the high-speed traders and the big institutions. If you have a two-tier system, what you're going to do is ring out of the markets, ring out of the markets all the retail investors. And if we do that, we've changed the fundamental notion of capitalism and commercialism in the United States. Mm. It's hard to see how this all gets changed, though. I mean, there was a story out in the New York Times, I believe it was yesterday, <laughs> talking about profitability for high-frequency fre traders. It's down year-over-year right. year, 35% and down from the peak, I think, 74%. Uh, we have news out on Bloomberg today that a high-frequency trader, uh, Alidian Partners, I believe, uh, is closing its doors. Um, is this situation just going to fix itself with people getting out of the game? Or is, uh, is no, that completely no, wrong? No, come on. You're, 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 you're still talking about, what, a billion and a half or a billion and a quarter of profits this year from high-frequency trading. To be sure, it's down from $5 billion three years ago, but that's still a lot of money. People are still going to be in this business uh, if they can make a millicent uh, in doing it. Uh, th this is a problem that's going to persist. Fra if the high speed traders all left tomorrow, that's not going to solve the market fragmentation problem. If high, street, high, high frequency traders all left tomorrow, it wasn't going to bring m people back into the marketplace feeling that they're being, being given a fair shake. If they all stop tomorrow, high frequency trading, you're still not going to have retail investors believe that there's some qualitative judgment that's guiding these markets as opposed to just quantitative uh, uh, switching. It's not going to happen. And at the end of the day, you mark my words, at the end of the day when they go through, when all the experts go through all the different alternatives for dealing with what they call this problem, you're going to find that introducing the concept of human judgment one way or another back into the trading process is going to be the, is going to be the answer. I don't have an answer for what that is, but that's going to be the answer in some form. All right, let's leave it there. Ralph Ferrara, partner at Proskauer Rose <laughs> LLP. Thank you so much for your time today, sir. Be well. You too. If you'd like to learn more about the cases and issues we just discussed, be sure to go check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and also on the Bloomberg Terminal. You can see more of our videos on YouTube and you can follow our updates on Twitter. I'm Lee Pacquiao. Thanks for watching.